We are here at the University of Texas in Austin talking with professors who are also authors. And now we are joined by Julia Mickenberg, who is the co-editor of this book, Tales for Little Rebels, a collection of radical children's literature. Professor Mickenberg, what are these tales for little rebels? What are these tales for little rebels? Well, we, um, my co-editor and I, uh, Phil Nell, we tried to um, find um, a balance of pieces that would represent um, works of literature that were created for children by representatives of um, radical movements throughout the 20th century. So we have things from the socialist movement in the early 20th century, from the communist movement in the 1920s and 1930s. We have stuff representing the new left, um, feminism, um, and kind of the whole range. And we could have started earlier. Um, there was uh, children's literature associated with the abolitionist movement, basically. If you get some kind of political movement, you will often find that there's an interest in, in getting children to understand the aims of that movement. So the socialists, the communists, etc., they each had a, a program to write children's literature. Is that correct? Um, a coordinated mm, program? Sort of, not exactly. Um, it was less coordinated than you would think. Um, in most cases, you had people who happened to be involved in these movements who, um, who got interested and um, started writing things. Um, the um, Communist Party um, Press, the example that you're showing there, is a book um, called The Story of Your Coat, and that was published by international publishers. And there was somebody who worked there was very interested in, ch in children's literature, and she started a children's series called Young World Books. And librarians seemed to not know that this was the Communist Party's press because these books were sold to regular um, libraries. And in fact, um, a couple of the best-selling um, sci science writers for children of all time got their start writing stories for international publishers, Young World Books. Would you like me to tell you about that story? Go right ahead. That story, um, the story of your coat, um, is really just a story about um, the different workers who made a coat, starting from um, shearing the sheep to um, you know transporting it to a factory, um, the um, the dyeing the wool, the designer, all the different steps, and um, the to the extent that it's political, it talks about unionization. Um, it, I can't remember now, but it probably has pictures of workers of different races, which was a very political thing to do in the 1940s. You wouldn't have that. Um, and um, even stories that talked about unionization then. And, and there was also a kind of wave of these kinds of stories. That same author, Clara Hollis, did another book called The Story of Your Bread. And the idea was teach children the kind of um, mechanisms of, of how things work in the world. And that was meant to increase children's kind of critical thinking skills and understanding how things are um, related to one another. In fact, I, I interviewed the, um, for, for my um, first book, which I brought along, um, Learning from the Left, um, can, um, and, and I interviewed the, um, Betty Bacon, who was the um, person who started Young World Books. She was in a, um, a, uh, a nursing home for old radicals, essentially, <laughs> and um, she, um, Oh, what was I going to say about her? Um, You're talking about children's books? Oh, and books about science. I know. So I had actually, many of the books that, that Young World Books published were science books. And I said, why, why all these science books? That seems pretty, um, you know, if you're trying to teach kids about politics. And she said, well, to teach dialectical materialism. <laughs> because she had this, these, she was such a kind of hardcore Marxist that she had the idea that Marxism was the only kind of logical way to think. And if you taught children to think scientifically, they would simply automatically become Marxists. So that was her sort of naive view. But you will see, um, we did include in this collection um, a number of scientific stories, none of which will turn you into a Marxist by reading them. But you can see, um, oh, and the other thing I was going to say about the story of your coat, that actually um, choosing that theme, um, the beginning of Marx's capital, has a whole discussion about um, the making of a coat and about the linen versus the price of a coat. So you would never pick up on that, but if you happen to know, she's clearly trying to allude back to Mark somehow. <laughs> How popular were these stories? It totally depends on the story. 
So something like the story of your coat, I don't know that it ever got that popular. We included um, the original version of, version of uh, Dr. Seuss's The Sneetches, which obviously became very um, popular later. Dr. Seuss, I don't believe, was affiliated with any particular political movement except maybe the Democratic Party, but he was strongly um, anti-fascist and anti-racist. And The Sneetches, if, um, if you recall, is a story about, um, began as a story about anti-Semitism, but it's really about um, respecting differences. And so that was originally published, I believe, in Red Book, and then it became one of his you know, popular um, stories. Um, there's a piece in there called The Practical Princess by um, Jay Williams, and this was part of a wave of sort of feminist fairy tales that were published in the 19, mostly the 1970s and 1980s. I think that was a pretty um, popular books, book. Um, one of my favorite stories in there is a book um, by Charlotte Pomerantz called The Day They Parachuted Cats Over Borneo, a drama of ecology, and it's all about the un unintended consequences of um, DDT. And it's based on a true story of where they literally had to um, parachute cats into, um, into the island of Borneo in order to uh, control rats. So I think some of these stories were actually um, quite popular. And many of the authors are actually very well-known authors who, you, who had sort of other um, careers. The best example of that is the piece by um, Sid Hoff. Um, the piece called Mr. His, he wrote under the name um, A. Redfield, like a red field. He was the art editor for, um, I think, The New Pioneer, which was a communist children's magazine. And Mr. His is a story about um, a, a guy who owns an entire town and owns everybody in it and is you know, bad to his workers, and the workers eventually revolt. But it's written in a very silly tone. And um, he is better known for his work writing um, I Can Read books like Danny and the Dinosaur and Sammy the Seal. Um, so he's a very popular author. And then um, on the cover there, the um, artwork is by Crockett Johnson, who's the author of Harold and the Purple Crayon um, and the Barnaby strip. So um, we And did you add the sign that he's holding? or is No, that no, that was in there. He was also an art editor at the um, New Masses. Many of the most... Um, popular and well-known um, children's book authors were either, you know, directly active in, um, in radical movements or quite sympathetic to them. So um, Hoff is a good example. Wanda Gogg is another good example. Julia Mickenberg, when you look at some of the examples, particularly uh, mid-20th uh, century, does it seem, is it a little bit comical or a little bit naive the way oh. these are set up? Is that fair to yeah, say that absolutely. about them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that we tried to include, I mean, we were trying to include stuff that, that people would actually want to read. There was, you know, the nice thing is that we had tons to choose from. So even though there's 44 pieces in there, we were able to uh, select it down. But we wanted to um, also have historical accuracy, and we wanted to include what might seem like totally ridiculous things today because they existed and because it's kind of um, funny in their naivety. The best example of that, I think, um, is the ABC for Martin, which we call a communist ABC. And it has things like um, K is for Kremlin, where our Stalin lives, and B is for Bolshe, thorn in their side or something. And I can't, you know, I certainly wouldn't want to share that with my kids as any kind of an example of, um, useful um, literature, but, um, but I think it's as a historical example, and we were really doing this book as an act of um, historical recovery to say um, this, I think when people think of children's literature, they tend to think that politics is just absent, um, when in fact all children's literature is political. It's just not usually so explicitly so. And so we wanted to recover this, this really long running um, thread that um, while some of these authors are well known, many of these works are, I would say most of these works are not going to be well known. Or Professor Mickenberg, um, did commentators at the time uh, of a different political persuasion call out some of this literature and say, hey, beware, beware? Um, did you find examples of I that? I found some examples. I mean, one of the things that I really found um, in my um, first book, which focused on, um, book that w on material that was for um, that was written by uh, radical writers, but not necessarily political, because I was looking at how children's literature became a kind of way to escape um, blacklisting and became an outlet during the McCarthy era. So like many of the little golden books 
were written by radicals or the, the first books or the real books and the landmark books. And many of these popular sort of hack schlocky series are, are by um, left-wingers. And the politics are so...